Hi, everyone. This is Greg Harton. I'm the editorial page editor of the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette. And that guy over there is Rusty Turner. And he is the uh, uh, editor of the Northwest Arkansas Democrat Gazette. We appreciate you joining us today because we had the opportunity to visit with John Carr, who Hello. is from Rogers. And he is uh, a Republican running for the District 94 seat in the Arkansas House of Representatives. Uh, he's an independent information technology consultant, and it's his first run for public office. And I guess unless you count the primary, uh, that, that you had to go through the primary and, and you won that. And, uh, and now you face a uh, Democratic challenger in the November 3rd election. So thanks for joining us, John. Absolutely. Thanks for having me, Rusty and Greg. Um, first thing off the bat, would you just kind of describe District 94, kind of the, the, the lay of the land so people know where they're, uh, uh, whether they fall within that district? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, District 94 uh, comprises a good part of Northern Rogers. Uh, the north boundary is Highway 102 and Hudson. The uh, goes down to downtown Rogers about 7th, 2nd Street is where the uh, east boundary is. New Hope is the uh, it's south boundary, and it has a little piece of Bentonville up uh, right around the uh, Rainbow Curve area, kind of close to the Walmart gym. All right, so mostly mostly urban kind of developed area, not not really a lot of rural. Right, it's, geographically, it's a very small compact district. It's a few miles um, wide by a few miles long. Okay, all right. Um, well, if you would just to start us off, tell us a little bit about um, uh, what you, what has what you've been doing, I guess, since the primary to to get your message out there. What uh, um, why you you know decided to to make this run, and particularly what issues you hear from the people of the district that is important to to have representation in Little Rock about. Oh, sure, Rusty. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great uh, topic to start off with. Uh, first of all, I could say it's it's an honor to run for public office. Uh, definitely honored to be able to do that. Uh, one of the things that's really uh, great about the district is I really love talking to the people, getting a chance to get out and have conversations, and learn what's on people's minds and what's important to them. So some of the things that I've been hearing a lot about is uh, you know, I've been hearing about taxes, and uh, hearing about you know, government uh, regulations and things of that nature. Uh, one of the things I do have is I do have a, a business and technology background. Over 20 years of uh, business technology experience, I really would like to be able to bring to Little Rock, be able to help the uh, government run better and more efficient for the people, and uh, also be able to you know, bring down the expenses of the government. So, go ahead, Russ. Yeah, uh, John, I wanted to ask you a, a couple of questions about our, our current situation. You know, we're we're having this meeting uh, via Zoom because of uh, uh, the, the pandemic. Uh, right. It's affected every aspect of everyone's life over the last six or seven months. So can you talk a little bit about how you, how you think the state government has, uh, has responded to, the, to, the, to this uh, pandemic? And if there's anything you would like to have seen, you, you would have liked to have seen done differently. And, and also what you think the legislature's role is in, in helping the state respond and recover from, from the from, from the crisis. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, this is something that literally happened right after the Republic, right around the end of the Republican primary. And uh, it's something that I know we've been learning more about every day. And there's been a lot of people doing a lot of research on it. One thing that's been really good is the governor did daily updates at 1.30, which I watched virtually all of those to stay informed. I think the communication has been good to get the information out to the people. And I know that we've just been all working together on it. Okay, and uh, do you see a, uh, a role or a greater, do you think the legislature needs to take a greater role in how, it how we've responded to the pandemic? I mean, it's been, you know, this emergency happened when the, when the General Assembly is not in session. Uh, and, and there have been some lawmakers who have, who, have, who have expressed the desire to have a greater role uh, for the legislature to have a greater role. So what, what, since, since you're asking the voters to send you to the legislature, What's your, uh, what's your thinking on that? Absolutely, and that's a, that's a great question, uh, Greg. So one of the things about the, uh, the legislature is it really should be helping to assist. I know there's, uh, there's been some talk about the Emergency Services Act of 1973 and 
potentially some changes there that could be made to get the legislature involved. Because usually an emergency is by by nature really a short-term situation. And I think it would be very helpful to have the legislative branch involved as well as the executive. Okay. Some of the uh, some of the lawmakers uh, had filed a, a lawsuit uh, to to get that uh, to challenge, I guess, some of the the uh, uh, authority of the governor and and to try to uh, to try to through through the courts uh, get more of those get those kind of thrown out so that the legislature could have more of a voice in it. Um, uh, I think a judge just yesterday had had thrown that case out, but um, uh, you know they felt very strongly that the governor. Uh, uh, that it, the the case, the situation had gone on too long, and that the le legislature ought to be directly more directly involved. Um, uh, what did you think about that uh, that approach? Well, I'm sure that's a, a topic that we'll take up in you know, the legislature in January is what to do with the Emergency Services Act uh, in 1973. I mean, at this point, it's kind of a moot point because the legislature will be meeting in January. Okay. Um, and I think, I, I don't know if you, if you answered this, forgive me, but the, uh, the job of, of Asa Hutchinson, I mean, how, how would you evaluate how he's, how he's attacked this, uh, uh, this whole pandemic and the, and the state's response? Well, I think it's been very good how he's been communicating with the people, having the daily updates at one thirty with him. We had Dr. Nate Smith for a while, and then uh, you know Dr. Nate Smith went on to the CDC in Atlanta, and so Dr. Jose Romero has kind of stepped up and continued to assist with the briefings. The one thing he's done very well with is giving information to people, uh, being forthright, showing the charts every day, showing the trends of the seven-day rolling averages. He showed the, all the different information. I think he's been transparent with with us about uh, about the information. Okay. And in terms of, uh, you know, we've had a lot of candidates talk about the, you know, the timing of the masks and the, and the, uh, you know, business, you know, restrictions of those sorts of things. You, you feel like he's handled those uh, fairly decently. Yeah. I, I know initially he was talking a lot about education and uh, educating people to use the mask. He personally set the example. And uh, I know that really people without a mandate were actually social distancing and, you know, when I saw when I was out in public, people were saying it's six foot away. The, the mask, you know, it's, if people feel comfortable wearing one, that's fine. Uh, I know there's been a lot of debate about about the mask, but I know private businesses if they want to ask people to wear one politely. Most people truly do want to be part of the solution and truly do want to help. Okay. Um, during this whole pandemic, uh, alongside it, not necessarily related to it, but um, we've had this kind of upheaval in this country r with protests and, and, you know, just the, the questions about racial tensions and law enforcement, those sorts of things. Um, what do you feel like the role of a state legislator is um, certainly, you know, just over in Bentonville, you know, there was the, the protests there on the square and, and some here in Fayetteville and, um, and, and lots of voices, you know, calling out for some changes. Um, but, but what do you feel like if, if you're get if you get elected and you go to Little Rock, what, what's the role of a legislator to try to deal with some of the, the issues that, that we've seen brought up really across the country? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Uh, one of the things a legislator can do besides legislation is be a good example. Um, one of the things I try to do personally is I love talking to people. I love sitting down with them, getting to know them. It's amazing and fascinating what you can learn about somebody by just simply having lunch with them. Their backgrounds, their experiences, it's just the power of, of personal human interaction. It's just such an amazing thing. The... Um, uh a lot of the calls are for, you know, changes to the systems, uh, the, the, you know, law enforcement and that sort of thing, um, which, you know, the legislature can have some, some feedback in. Um, do you feel like that's part of actually doing anything legislatively as part of the response to that? Or do you feel like it's just giving a, giving people a chance to be heard? 
Well, it's very important for people to have the right to, to be heard. You know, we have the First Amendment, which gives the right to peacefully assemble. And a lot of it really is just human to human uh, communication. That's something that, you know, when, like I say, when you actually sit down with somebody, it's just amazing what, uh, what people get to see and what they get to learn about each other. And just, uh, just like, wow, that person's amazing. You learn new things, you learn new experiences. And that's what we just have to do. It's just you know, basically uh, love each other and talk to each other. In, in the age of, of, of social distancing, that's a little bit difficult. How, uh, uh, as a candidate and, and as potentially a lawmaker, um, you know, how do you, have, how do you create those opportunities to, to have that interaction? Yeah, and that's one thing uh, that you have to do. Obviously, you, have, you can't have the large gatherings right now because of the, the need to social distance. But you can certainly uh, certainly get out when you're at the grocery store, talk to people, see how they're doing, check on their day, wish them a good day. That's some things that you can do. You know, there's also opportunities like we're doing here on Zoom meetings. We have those. So there's lots of different ways in today's world in which we can do that. It's just uh, technology is a very powerful thing. Um, shifting shifting gears a little bit. In your introduction, you mentioned um, keeping an eye on government regulation. Right. restrictions on businesses and that sort of thing. Anything specific in mind along those lines uh, of, of regulations you'd like to see adjusted or, or, uh, or, or made or changed to make, to, to, to make uh, businesses more efficient, make government more efficient? Right, and that's, a, that's, an, that's an excellent topic. And one thing I do as a, I've got 20 years of uh, professional experience working on making uh, IT systems more efficient. That's my background, that's my experience. And I know that there's ways that, for instance, with computer systems, you can actually tune systems to make them more efficient, reduce disk space, you can reduce network usage. One thing also that people may know about is that with a mainframe, there's something called million instructions per second or a MIP. There's ways you can uh, make computer programs run more efficient to where you really use less MIPs. Because for example, a lot of uh, computer systems, if you have unnecessary computer processing, you know, companies and businesses pay by that, uh, pay by that unit. And so if you can get the amount of processing down, there's lots of opportunities there. That's something that definitely be an area where I could dig into. A lot of the, uh, in, in response to the pandemic, uh, Arkansas state government has had some computer related problems um, with uh, the, the unemployment assistance, the, 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 I guess they call it the pandemic unemployment assistance. Um, and, uh, uh, as that has gone on from with your professional background, have you kind of evaluated that and, and gotten some sense as to what needs to happen at the state that, uh, that can, because, uh, because a, a couple of those instances have been, uh, have really held things up. Yeah, it kind of goes, goes back to what I was talking about previously. Uh, if you've got different computer systems that are uh, running different, different software programs and they're on different platforms and, you're having to bridge computer systems or bridge data from one system to another, you do increase what's called the points of failure. And so one of the things we'll have to look at is how to centralize some of the systems to make those type of things easier. Uh, tell me a little bit about uh, your thoughts uh, on the, the three issues that are coming up on the uh, November 3rd ballot that the legislature, um, the, the last session, or I guess, yeah, two, 2019, they put it on the bat, put on these three issues on the ballot. Start off with issue number one, which is that uh, that sales tax uh, for the state highways and county and city roads. Uh, what's your perspective on that? Oh, sure. This is actually a question that also came up during the Republican primary. One thing I can say about it is since it's with the, uh, the citizens, um, I literally have one vote of a million votes that are going to be cast on that issue on November 3rd. Um, I do have, personally, I do have concerns about putting a permanent tax in the Constitution. I know that 10 years ago, when the voters voted on this, the intent was to, to have a temporary tax to go make the repairs and do the things that were necessary to the roads, and it was uh, supposed to sunset. So well, does, there's been some, there's been some criticism of the proposal because, uh, you know, there, there's, there are people who believe that that you know it was sold as a temporary tax, and and now it's now they're being asked to make it permanent, and there's some there's some resistance to uh, 
uh, to keeping the tax on a permanent basis after it was sold in that way. Did um, did you see it that way, or is 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 this just a natural progression uh, mm -hmm. from where we were? And I'm actually hearing that from a lot of people in in the district that uh, you know ten years ago it was proposed as a temporary tax, and now the intent is to uh, make it permanent. One thing we also have to be very careful about is putting in too many amendments in the Constitution. For example, the United States Constitution was uh, founded in 1787, and we've had 27 amendments. Arkansas's Constitution was founded in 1836, and it's had nearly 100. <laughs> Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, that's that's created a few problems every every yeah so often. Um, so in in terms of uh, uh, you know, if the voters decide, you know, not to approve this tax, um, one thing I've gotten from people who are who are for issue one or against issue one is everybody agrees about the need. It seems like that 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 we do need to do better on our roads and highways and, and as far as maintaining them. And, um, and certainly the growth in Northwest Arkansas, we've benefited from some new highways. So uh, as a lawmaker, how, how would you like the state to pursue funding for state highways? So one of the things I uh, definitely want to look at is where are we spending money not unnecessarily? One example I can kind of give up here locally you guys may be familiar with the fact that we had the, the steel ropes that they put in where it's now Highway 49. And then several months later, they pulled them out to start widening the roads. So we need to look for things like that where we can be more efficient. And that way we can have more money to work with. Uh, that's definitely something that I would like to look at. So in terms of, of highways, you would I take that to mean that 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 if two years from now they're proposing another tax to, to support it, that, that, that you generally have a, you, you don't think they need the additional revenue that, that you think it can be found within existing revenue? Oh, definitely. I do know that, uh, I've heard that the books that they have for each state agency, in fact, they're going through the, uh, the budget process right now. And I understand from what I've heard, those books are about 12 inches thick for each agency. So take time to review, but definitely I'm sure that we can find different ways to be more efficient. Private businesses, they're always looking for ways to run more efficiently and uh, to be able to do more with less, and, uh, be able to take care of the customers. We can do the same thing with state government. So have you formed an opinion on issue two? That would be, that's the, that's the issue that would change the, the way we limit uh, legislators' terms. Uh, currently, uh, legislators can serve 16 years in your house. Uh, this new proposal, as I understand it, would would uh, require you to leave office after 12 years, but after a four-year break, you could come back. So do you have, have you formed an opinion on, on that change and whether you think it's a good idea or not? Yeah, I've been, I've been thinking a lot about, uh, about issue number two. I know the, the intent of it is to try to, you know, just alter the term limits, because currently right now we do have uh, 16 years that you're allowed to serve. You know, I know if you if you do cut it to 12 and then take four years off, from what I understand, 95% of people don't really re don't really return after that. Um, I know that uh, here lately, even just in Northwest Arkansas, we've got a lot of legislators that decide, chose on their own not to run for, for re-election as it is. So I don't know if it'll make a huge difference one way or the other in terms of the way the term limits exist today. Okay. And uh, issue three is about changing the way that citizen-led initiatives uh, are, are qualify for ballot, for, for vote. Um, two, sides to every, uh, two sides to every story. Critics of this initiative say that it's going to make it much, much more difficult for a citizen-led led initiative to get on the ballot. It is therefore not very democratic. Uh, supporters say that the uh, current process uh, makes it so that 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 um, uh, collection signature collection can be done only in metro areas and kind of and, and they can kind of ignore the rural areas of the state and also uh, there's a fear that special interests from out of state can manipulate that system so uh what's your thought what, do, do you have a position one way or the other on on issue three so that's a uh, yeah you pretty much talked about a lot of the concerns on both sides of the issue kind of going back to what i was talking about before the United States Constitution has 27 amendments. Arkansas's Constitution has 100. And your Constitution really should be a framework for government, not just to put a lot of different little things in there, here and there. A lot of stuff should be handled through uh, 
legislation. I know that definitely the concern is, is that outside groups will come in, hire a bunch of paid canvassers, go out, collect signatures, and put something on the ballot. Okay. I, I think I, I'm sitting here thinking that uh, it, it, it shows that the people who wrote the uh, Arkansas Constitution probably weren't up to snuff with the people who wrote the <laughs> the national constitution um uh, uh I, I think that's probably indisputable <laughs> mm -hmm. like you're talking about that it's been amended a hundred times since it since it was drafted um uh, one of the issues that's been going on for years now uh that is uh even though it's not within you know benton county where your district is or or uh, uh, it's it's a little bit of a drive from here on the on the northwest corner, but um, uh, the Buffalo National River, uh, you know, that's been going on and uh, for years with the the uh, hog farm uh, that that right. uh, located there, and and uh, um, the governor had proposed a permanent moratorium on uh, on the large scale kind of hog farms that 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 one was and the state spent six plus million dollars to buy out that one hog farm um I, and I, I know buffalo national river gets a lot of attention from people here in northwest arkansas really really pay a lot of attention to it so um what do you think the state's approach ought to be in terms of protecting that the watershed of of the buffalo national river um, you know, it, it, the state, the state, um, has, has really been debating that a lot. And, and I don't know that we're, I don't know that we've moved the ball in terms of exactly what to do long-term with it. What do you think the state ought to be doing? Yeah, I know that's a very complicated issue from what I do understand about it. You've got uh, farmers that need to be able to, uh, basically process the, our meat and you know, the process of food chain, you also have the concerns about, about the water as well. I know that one of the things a lot of people don't realize, even though I've been in county, is we actually are a very rural county still. I think we're number one in beef production. So definitely something we need to look at in detail and uh, definitely dig in some more. Okay, do, do, you, do you have any thoughts about the idea that, that Asa Hutchinson has supported of, of putting some kind of moratorium on, on those types of facilities around the Buffalo National River? That's something I need to do a, a lot more digging into and more investigating about. One of the things I really admire is a man named Henry, Henry Ford. I know he was somebody that uh, didn't necessarily, wasn't an expert on every topic, but he knew who to talk to. That's something I definitely want to dig in a lot more just like Henry Ford did. Okay. So who, who, who do you think you would like to talk to? Not, not by name, but just yeah, yeah. The, in, the interest that, that would be uh, going on there. Yeah, definitely the Farm Bureau would be somebody I could talk to about that, to get some more information. Okay. Um, going back a little bit on the question of, of kind of the race relations and all of that, and you, you talked about how valuable it is to talk to people. Right. One of the things that's tough uh, for legislators is, um, I think, making sure that they're talking to people beyond just their usual circle. Um, I think that's true for everybody. Yeah, you know, uh, we all have our Facebook feeds and all that stuff, and and we kind of get to pre-select who who it is that is is on those. Um, so how do you make sure whether it's an issue like race relations or the Buffalo River, how do you make sure that you're hearing from people that, that wouldn't necessarily always be kind of in your orbit? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Uh, so one of the things that you know, I personally like to do is I like to talk to all kinds of people with different backgrounds. I know that one of the things that in the Republican Party is we've got a, a great history. You know, we... Uh, we were founded in 1856 as an abolitionist movement. And our party uh, actually sponsored the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendments to the United States Constitution. In uh, 1920, we actually uh, fought to give women the right to vote in the 19th Amendment. Even within our party today, like 40 years ago, we had, uh, we had great presidential candidates. We had diversity on the stage. You know, we had Ben Carson, who was an African-American man. Uh, Bobby Jinder, who was an Indian man. We had uh, Ted Cruz and Marco Rubio, who were uh, Hispanic men. We had Carly Fiorina as a uh, as a woman. 
And one of the things that I've been very blessed with within the party is just being able to meet people of different backgrounds and different experiences. And, you know, nationally, we've got some great candidates running as well. We've got like Kim Clayson, she's running out in uh, you know, Baltimore, Maryland. And young Kim, she's running out in uh, California. And Ana Paulina Luna, she's running out in uh, Florida. So that's one of the things that uh, you know, I take a lot of pride in my background in terms of already talking to people of different backgrounds, different experiences. And uh, yeah, you're absolutely right. There are a lot of people that feel very comfortable being within the circle of just who they know, just that particular group. But I make a very special effort to get out and actually talk to a lot of different people. Because that's one thing I do. I love people and I love to serve people. How about, a lot uh, of the... John, how about, how about interacting with people of different, uh, with Democrats or Libertarians? Uh, there's some of those in your district as well, so. Oh yeah, I, I love I love talking to uh, to Democrats and Libertarians and just learning and understanding where they come from because that's part of it as well. Kind of going back to what we were talking about earlier is we just need to we may not agree on things, but at least we sit down and understand and just listen to each other. And I think we learn a lot by doing that. Greg, okay. I'm sorry I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, that's okay. Um, uh, I think we've pretty much covered all of my questions, uh, but but I. I I know that I don't always think of all the right questions to ask. So uh, give me a sense of, you know, of any questions or issues that, that you think the voters of your district particularly might want to hear from you about um, that, that I haven't asked about, or that Rusty hasn't asked about just to, to uh, uh, help, help give us a sense of what's going to be important for you. And maybe you could also tell us a little bit about if you're elected, what, what uh, committees you would like to serve on down there, if you've given that any thought. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that's excellent uh, to talk about. So one of the things that's most important to me is my constituents. Um, like I say, I spend a lot of time dedicating myself to talking to people, understanding what's important to them and building those relationships in the community. You know, I've talked to between the Republican primary and the general election and just simply being out in the community, I've talked to many, many people. And like I said earlier, a lot of people are uh, concerned about the regressive taxes in our district, the fact that it, it's hurting people. Uh, people have been telling me about the used car tax because I've been talking to the community. And so it's some things that we just need to look at to be able to help our community to be able to thrive. Uh, so in terms of committees, uh, one of the committees that would be a, a great fit would be the technology committee. So to be able to use the uh, my business and technology background to serve the people of Arkansas, you know, let's build a, let's build a great Arkansas. Let's uh, let's make let's make it run like a business. And, you know, our taxpayers are like the customer. A business needs to take care of the customer. So that's something very passionate about is making sure that we take care of the constituency and their needs. If um, if something good has come out of the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which I tend to believe something good comes out of bad situations a lot of the time. Um, uh, it might be the broadband um, uh, expansion in Arkansas. Give me your thoughts on, on how the state has tackled that and, uh, and anything else the state, you think the state needs to do in terms of broadband. So yeah, definitely one of the things I'm glad to see in the CARES Act but there was uh, money allocated to that. Yeah, I've been watching the steering committee yeah, in terms of how they've been tackling that issue, and trying to get the get the receivers out there and looking and see what we need to do for that issue. Because that's definitely something for the future that uh, we definitely will need more broadband uh, out in our communities. All right. Well, Rusty, uh, do you have anything else you want to touch on? No. Uh, I, John, I appreciate you spending some time with us this morning. Thank you. No, I really appreciate you guys. I think it's been a good conversation, a good chance to just kind of have a get reach out to the readers. All right. And uh, John, anything else that uh, we didn't touch on that you wanted to say? I just wanted to say thank you to you both for today. A good conversation. And, uh, definitely one of the things is I look forward to the opportunity to serve my community and be able to serve the great people of District 94. All right. Well, we appreciate your time so much today. And uh, uh, and wish you well. Thank you so much. All right. Take care of yourself. You too.